Hey guys, welcome to HBCU Drumline Talk. My name is Ricardo, and I'm joined by my great friend, my brother in percussion, E.P. the Great. And man, it's been a hot summer. I yeah. tell you where I'm at, it's about 116, and it's just, it, it will not let up. It's, yeah. it's hot every day, all day long. <laughs> so wow. I hope, hope everybody's having a safe summer and, and staying cool as well. And uh, E.P., what, what you got to say on that? It's hot. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's real hot. So... Like I said, everybody, please stay cool this summer. Um, it's, been a, it's been a minute since we talked to everyone, so we're glad to see everybody again. And before we get started today, AEP, you think about back before we actually got our started in percussion, really dug deep into percussion at this point. Some of the jobs that we had before we, we jumped in, I, I can remember myself, um, I had to work UPS unload, you know, cigarette packing factories, um, all, yeah. all type of strange things. What about yourself? Yeah, I remember the cigarette, cigarette packing. We worked that job together. I used to clean the mall. I, mean, I used to clean the floors, man, when the mall closed, you know. It was it was, it was fun, though. Yeah, you know? it, just all type of strange jobs before we really got, you know, into percussion and doing what we wanted to do. And I bring that up because uh, the guest that we have today, he's also, you know, we, we like to say humble beginnings, right? And I think um, I, I read an article here where... Our guest, he was like um, a substitute teacher at some point, shined shoes, you know, librarian. He even raised some pigeons and things like that, um, did all type of things. And the person that I'm speaking of, if, if you have marched in marching bands anywhere from high school, middle school, this person has touched you. And in one way or another, you have used this person sticks. And the person that I'm talking about is the one and only, the great Mr. Ralph Hardeman. So I wanna welcome Mr. Hardeman. We'll call him Ralph at this point to HBCU Drumline Talk. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? Appreciate it, uh, Ricardo. Big time, yeah. thanks. Yeah, no problem. So we're gonna jump right on in. EP, you can take over. All right, so get started. Um, I guess talk to us about how you guys started in percussion. How we started in percussion. Is that a question for me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Well, it started, uh, gosh, I think I was about six years old. And it all uh, came about because uh, my three oldest sisters were uh, musicians, uh, violin, viola, and cello. So uh, being around them, really exp exposed me to music at a very young age. And of course, you know, I wanted to participate. And so uh, the last thing that my parents wanted was somebody playing drums around the house. I didn't find that out until later on. But um, yeah, I mean, they, uh, they auditioned me on everything but drums. <laughs> Started out, uh, I think it was flute was the first thing they tried me out for them. I wasn't interested in that, but I it was my parents, so I tried out. Uh, fortunately for me, um, I had some teeth that were missing because, you know, I was at that age where the primaries were coming out and the old man teeth were starting to come in. And so the air that I was blowing out wasn't going directly into the mouthpiece of the flute. And um, so that was a no-no, and I was happy about that. I had no idea that that was gonna, you know, keep me from playing flute, but I was happy about it. I didn't want to play flute. So I went from there to uh, string bass. Um, I kind of liked that, but I had to stand on a stool to play it. And I thought that was kind of weird, you know. I didn't want to stand on a stool. I didn't see anybody else standing on stools to play instruments, so. I didn't want to be a part of that. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, went through trumpet, brass instruments, this and that. And finally, you know, uh, I told my folks, I said, you know, I really want to play drums, you know, and it was a pause, it was real quiet. And, you know, they agreed and said, okay. And, you know, that's <clears throat> pretty much how I got started. Uh, joined the or or orchestra in elementary school and I was supported by uh, my sisters because they were the one that really made it happen, uh, you know, with the, with the band directors and everybody around. So 
my first part was a tambourine part for this piece. I think it was called Begin to Begin. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. My sisters showed me how to play it, how to read the music, because they were the one that taught me that as well, pretty much. And, uh, you know, I did a pretty decent job on it. At least I thought I never heard any complaints. And uh, so that kind of started it out, you know, as, as I continued on, I um, uh, was fortunate enough to be able to join the Los Angeles Police Junior Band, which was a concert band and a marching band. I saw them uh, in a parade going down the street and fell in love with the uniforms. This was when I was a kid, of course. And uh, they were playing this piece called Dragnet that maybe you guys are familiar with as a TV program. Uh, and, you know, I had recognized the piece, man, and the band was marking, marching down the street and they had these killer uniforms on and, you know, and white spats and they had these little kind of Boy Scout, Explorer Scout hats on. And I noticed that, uh, you know, it was, it was mixed. So there was, you know, blacks, Chinese, white folks, you know, just good old uh, Americans. And, you know, I was really attracted to that at the same time, along with the music and the drum line coming down the street with these gold metal flake drums. And man, they were just blowing doors, man. And I said, mom, dad, that, that's it. So they said, oh, you know, we'll look into it. And what they found out was um, the Los Angeles Junior Police Band was, uh, had members from Los Angeles as well as greater Los Angeles, all the outside areas. And they had these buses, these police bus that had different spots that they would stop at in different parts of LA and outside of LA, Orange County, you know, different places to, to pick all, everybody up. So they took care of everybody's ride. And so that was a plus, cause you know, meanwhile I had at that particular time, I had uh, one brother and four sisters, one that put nine to completely in the uh, nine sisters and brothers. Uh, more came after that, but yeah, so, you know, uh, the police band was something that I was really attracted to, just seeing them, you know, going down the street, but also having the chance to get picked up in these buses, you know, so they had some buses that came to the hood where I was from, I grew up in Los Angeles. So it was cool. And it was like two blocks right up the street too. So, I get on and, you know, I'm seeing all these different people on here. It's kind of a trip. And it was, you know, just talking with everybody and they're going, yeah, you know, what do you play? And I said, well, I play drums. Oh, Derek, come up here. You know, there's another drum guy. And Derek Smith was a good friend of mine for ages. And he's the one that taught me and a whole bunch of the other brothers about uh, rudimental drumming, you know, which was uh, great. So we'd get on our folks' ironing boards and uh, just start tearing it up and listening to drum corps records and bands and stuff like that. But it was a concert band as well. So, you know, there was concert music to learn and I learned pretty quick. I was picked up everything really fast. So that's kind of how I got started. Uh, uh, went from, from, you know, of course, playing in these school orchestras and bands all the way through high school. Uh, they weren't the best. But, you know, I had a chance to perform and play with them, you know, and that, that really counted. Plus, that made me a cool person in high school because I was the best drummer around, not necessarily the drum set player. But I was kind of nerdy when I was young, so, but I was cool because I played drums, you know, it was one of those things. There so, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that was it. Kept going and then wound up uh, the guy, Derek Smith, I was telling you about, he's the one that... Um, was telling us about drum corps. I had no idea about drum and bugle corps and this and that. Uh, but he was telling me about it, but Officer Horde, who was the band director, you know, that was all police that ran the whole thing. Uh, I was told uh, by the guys that, ah, you know, when we go to the state championship competition, that Officer Horde really didn't want anybody coming around uh, going to see the drum corps part of the show. It was like state band and drum corps. And I was like, why is that? Because because he always loses his members to core, <laughs> you know? And I was like, man, well, I love the police band. I'm not going anywhere. Of course, after I saw the first drum corps contest, I was sold. You were out of there. 
I was <laughs> way out, man, real fast. And I, I joined um, the Velvet Knights Drumming Bugle Corps from, uh, from Santa Ana, California. A uh, pretty popular group, again, you know, mixed. And for some reason about that, that, you know, that, that made me feel a little bit more comfortable because uh, uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in was so rough. And of course it was all brothers and it was hardcore LA that, you know, I, I had to struggle in time growing up uh, as a child, you know, uh, you know I, I, I didn't believe in what was going on. And, you know, you have to fight this person to be this man. I'm going, man, I ain't fighting nobody. But I did learn how to defend myself when I got popped upside the head for the first time. You know, it was like, oh, okay. So this is what it's gonna be like, huh? But anyways, so, um, you know, I, I joined the Velvet Knights and I, I learned a lot quick over there. At the same time, I was being accused as the guy that made the ticker that made all the mistakes. And I knew it wasn't me, you know? And so I had to deal with that for a couple of years. And then finally I said, you know what? You know, I'm gonna go uh, audition for the uh, Anaheim Kingsmen. They were a better core. Uh, and let, let, let's see how I fit in over there. So I joined them in 1971. I left Velvet Knights in 1970. Joined them in 1971 and I was not the ticker. <laughs> I was not the guy making the mistakes. We found that out real quick. In fact, when the competition first started, and all my homeboys that you know I grew up drumming with, that were that was their, uh, that went over to Velvet Knights, seeing me in this other group of Kingsmen, and they couldn't believe it because they didn't have no brothers off in there either. But I wasn't caring about that too much. You know, I just wanted to be with the best, and they were the best in California at that time. So, you know, I made it in, and that's how I made it career out of a uh, rudimental drum and just playing over there and after a year I was writing for the group uh I don't know how that really came about except that we all did some writing here and there and you know we're just different things for for the drum line and the people happen to really like my stuff and I got better at that real quick so it was, it was kind of a blessing so that that's how my whole drum thing started and of course at the same time during junior high and high school, I was learning drum set as well. But as you guys probably well know, uh, most of the cats with the rudimental hands, they spend so much time there that it's, it's hard for, for anybody to, uh, to switch from this, just drumming here and get on the drum set because you haven't been working those feet, okay? So you had the hands, but the feet were another whole thing. And, you know, that's something that we all had to realize, you know, when we first sat down as kids, it's like, well, you know, we can play around on the drums, but this feet thing with this hi-hat and this bass drum, man, is, it was really like starting back over again, at least for me. And uh, I got pretty decent on it. I found out I was better on playing uh, swing and jazz because it was a lot of independent stuff, of course, between the, the right and left hand and the right foot and left, uh, left foot. Of course, the only thing that was real consistent was the right hand and the right foot with that hi hat and that ride. So I was better at the jazz thing than I was at at uh, the funk and rock and all that kind of stuff because you know there was a lot of other things going on when you were playing all the killer funk beats back in the day. Uh, but you know, so I, I'm a decent drum set player, but really started kind of made a career out of the marching percussion thing just because I got really good at it really really fast you know so that's kind of that's kind of how i got going and i'm just about retired right now i'm 70 years old so Man. had my share <laughs> okay. well thank you for a lot of good information there um elijah you got yeah. anything you want to chime in on that no man very good information yeah, a lot of, lot of good information. So you really talked about how you got your start. So we really appreciate that. And I'm sure our viewers appreciate that. And for our up and coming um, folks who are interested in percussion, right? Who want to be percussionists as well. What are some good practice tips for our up and coming percussionists right now? You know, let's say a kid is interested in high school. What, what, what tips would you give a kid in high school as opposed to in college, a freshman in college? Or just, well, just going through college school? Sure. Um, 
first of all, you got to tell everybody to slow down because all drummers, when they pick up the sticks, they want to go as fast as they can. You know, <laughs> even you got, you know how it is. It's like, uh, you know, like, yeah. like, hold on. And like, it was, it was really tough for, uh, for me at first to like learn and play everything slow. But that's to me is, is the most important is when you're trying to read music and figure out and you're beginning to work on technique, you got to go slow so you can pay attention to the motions that you're doing and the quality of sound that, uh, that you're producing on the drum, which was something I learned at a younger age too. The difference between, you know, the beating spots and uh, how if you hold the sticks different ways, how you can sometimes choke out your sound and how sometimes if you hold the, the sticks too tight, how, how it would get in the way of what you're really trying to do because there's a lot of uh, dexterity work with, with the fingers and stuff that, that we all learn to apply. So that's kind of where, where I like take your time and you know listen to your instructors and take everything slow and always work with a metronome. You know, for playing in time, because you know that's really our number one job as drummers, is uh, keeping time. It always has been that way, even from the beginning, way back in the in the day when it was the flag and the, the fife guy and the drummer. You know, yeah. it was all about uh, keeping time. And a lot of people don't know this, and I'll just go on and say it: that the the drummer and the rudiments, all of our rudiments that we all came up with, was because the drummer was sending signals to the the army behind them when they were marching. Right. You know, all the rudiments and the cadences and stuff were made up were things that called out the commands. So, of course, later on, you know, uh, respect was lost for the drummer. And that was the first people that got taken out eventually after they found out that the drummer was, you know, they wanted to take the drummer out because it would disturb you know, the whole military thing and people would be scattered because they called out all of the command. So yeah, I thought I'd throw that in there for, for possibly people that uh, just didn't know that. Yeah, that's some, that's some major information for anyone who didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that. And one thing that you did point out and it's just so major, just, just please take your time. It's no rush. The drums aren't going anywhere. It's just, it's just take your time, please. <laughs> yeah, everybody, well, you know, drummers, you know, whenever people, somebody's looking at it, they look at the fascination of what the hands are doing because, you know, the sound is coming out and then everybody goes, wants to see what the hands are doing and the hands are like, it's like a blur after a while. You know, if, if you're growing up looking at, uh, you know, Buddy Rich and guys like that, when they're playing and you listen to all this drum set stuff, the hands are just going crazy and everybody wants to to do that. They, the first thing they think is pick up the stuff. They want to try to play some rolls or buzz or play, move the hands fast. And that's the thing that you really got to like slow down. You'll get there eventually yeah. if you really want to do this in the future. But, you know, here's the first steps to it. And it's difficult for a lot of people. The, the ones that that uh, really do that uh, wind up going on and pursuing their career uh, as drummers. And of course, that's a lot of information I learned from just you know, listening to a lot of the heavies that drum yeah. set players that uh, I grew up to, that's the same information that all, all of them shares. Slow down, don't get too excited about, you know, the flipping the sticks, back sticking and all the fancy stuff. You know, you gotta go start out slow and get those tap heights right and the strokes right. And then as we move along, you know, we'll see how your talent develops and we'll get into some of the killer gutsy point. Well Point well taken, thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Hardiman, uh, that's a, another quick question. Have you noticed throughout your time, noticed a drummer can play it real fast, you know, somewhat clean, but when you slow it down, they're struggling. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I remember seeing a lot of that, and quite frankly, I went through that too. You know, and then when that's how I discovered that what I was playing fast wasn't really that good, <laughs> you know, and eventually I learned, you know, that, man, you got to slow it down and to, to break it down. Otherwise, you can only get so far, you know, you still got to it's just like anything else. You know, the fundamentals got to be there for you to be successful. Uh, of course, there's a lot of people that are more talented than others. 
And of course, you know, I remember that there was always somebody better than me. And it wasn't because they, not necessarily that they worked as hard as I did, it's that some people are just a little bit more talented. They, things come easier to, to uh, other people. But still, the fundamentals, man, I have to keep going back to that. Uh, everybody's got to learn those fundamentals. To, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Of course you do. <laughs> you know, okay, I okay. see you got uh, them, them coolies and them bongos back there, man. I'm looking in the background over there. I'm going, uh huh. Do a you know, something. <laughs> yeah, a lot of something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, I love playing a Latin percussion as well. That's that's my uh, second favorite too. You know the rudimental. Sometimes I'll switch back and forth. So you know I had to say something about what I was seeing back here because you know that's 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 another cup of tea for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was my first love. Was the Latin percussion. You know, then marching. They go hand in hand. You know. Hey, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. You still got to learn the, the techniques for them. You know, especially, you know, when it comes to, well, anything, but, you know, like Latin percussion, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that fake it, but you can't really get the real sounds, yeah. you know, the real tech technique. And you know that as well as being a player, you can't, you can't fake it. So it still gets back to fundamentals, right? Right. Yes, sir. You know, so. Okay. I'm just, I, some, sometimes I forget what I'm talking about because part of it is, age and sometimes you know i get to froth and frothing at the beak i've been <laughs> quiet, quiet lately with the you know with the pandemic and this and that and not not spending a lot of time talking to people about drums except for on zooms i've done a lot of that so sometimes i get carried away and out of focus but, uh, just keep me honest <laughs> i'll be good so, so going to the next question, you kind of already answered it. It was a two-part question. Um, okay. What advice would you give students that start marching band? Um, you want to add more on to that if you can, but what advice would you give first-time instructors? Uh, to make sure without being mean and getting a bad taste in, you know, in people's mouth, you know, you got to have, you got to respect the players if you expect them to respect you. And right off the bat, you got to make sure there's some some discipline involved uh, as anything productive that we do that has a group of people. There, there has to be a, a hierarchy set up and everybody just can't do what they want. And I've been to a lot of places where some people, some of the instructors didn't have control over that and they wasted half of their time trying to get everybody to shut up. Uh, to to listen, so that can be an uh, can be an issue, and some people think, oh, he's too hard. I'm going, well, no, that's no, you know, this is just what it takes to to be good down the road. You got to learn to to pay attention and listen. And you know, I I don't mind saying that to any group. I've spent a lot of time with all kind of groups from all kind of different hoods too. You know, like Brazilian and Puerto Rican, and every, everybody's the same. Everybody, you know, it's just like school. You know, I can remember growing up, growing up in school, and uh, you know, there was there was some homies over in class that disturbed, and they did that just because they got attention. You know, but it's really all about the 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 discipline and commanding respect from your, uh, from your students and giving them the equal respect as well, sitting down and talking about what you want to accomplish, uh, you know, first, but also in the process of letting them know that um, while that's going on, you know, there's rules that we all have to abide by. Yeah. And some people think, oh, he's so strict. It's like, no, 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 man, this is, you know, it, yeah, there has to be some level of strictness to get everybody's attention. Like me, I tell everybody that I teach that I wear two hats, okay? One is the serious teacher hat, and the other one, like, I, I love to have fun, and I'm crazy, and I crack jokes with all of my students and stuff, and then there's the fun cap. And I tell them their job is to know when it does, because it does this all the time. You know, I'll crack a joke to loosen things up and they might not even know what's going on, but sometimes you got to loosen up to the ensemble. You got a lot of people, you know, to relax a little bit because you, your job is to notice if they're 
getting a little uptight, what are you going to do about it to make sure that you still have a successful rehearsal or whatever? So, you know, for me, I wear two hats. I know some people that are strict all the time. And, I, you know, I don't have a problem with that because it's all about trying to learn something and you need to pay attention to, uh, you know, what your teachers are saying. So sometimes you got to be hardcore to get that point across. You know, yeah, of course. Jokes. You know, you know what I mean? It's like no joke, man. <laughs> Real. <laughs> Good point. You know, Good I, just to, I just want to echo something you said about wearing two hats. Um, uh, yeah, you can be strict, but you also have to listen and talk to them, you know, crack jokes just to, you know, keep them around up. That's just my opinion, but you know, you say the same thing, so. Yes, exactly. You know, like you gotta let them know you can hang out with them. Yeah. But there's a time when there's, there is a hierarchy and there is a separation, you know. Like if you were like me, then you'd be teaching right now, okay? Yeah. So you haven't achieved that yet. You're a student and let's keep it real. Yeah. You, know, you might be the best one, but you're still a student. You know, let's keep it real between the, you know, the who's running the scene and who's not. There's always got to be somebody. And, you know, how, how you do that is um, you allow, you know, you pick certain people. John, I want you to lead this this time. And they're like, they're like whoa, okay. You know, you pick some people that, you, you know, you want to let them get out there and get in front, learn to get be in front of people and speak to them. And you'll find out a lot that, you know, boy, some people are got some good future chops that they're building up to be a teacher because you can tell right away uh, the information is the information getting put out where everybody's going to understand. And that, that's one way you find out who you got with you. And plus, you want to like give everybody a chance to lead some kind of way, some kind of way. Uh, right. Another example is you know, when I was teaching Santa Clara Vanguard all those years, is I would have, we practice three times a week. And I started saying, you know, it's time for some of you guys to bring, you know, do a little four bar thing, a little two bar piece or whatever. And let's all get together and let's play your, let's play. And people are going, whoa, man, I get a chance to write something. And of course, everybody wants it to be cool, but you know, concentrate it's like it doesn't have to be extremely hard or you know the best thing you ever done it could be just a little exercise you want to do for everybody to work on something in unison anything but you start giving giving people a chance to open up and do something and you get more respect that way too there's 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 a two-way street you know between your students and yourself and then you find out hey man i got some hot students with some great ideas and you you can learn more who you want to nurture on the side, you know, to to grow because some people grow a lot faster than others. Yes, sir. Yeah. Information. Yeah. yeah, all good points. Thank you, um, sure. Mr. Hardiman, um, Elijah, and myself. Um, you know, we both come from the HBCU drumline world and everything. And um, there's been, you know, we've had some great guests on our our podcast at this point. And you know, the discussion comes up every once in a while about DCI and then HBCU style drumming, right? So what, what type of tips would you give someone, an HBCU student, right? Who's interested in transitioning or auditioning to a drum corps? What, what advice would you give them? Well, as, these days, a lot of the, the HBCU guys are starting to get, you know, the drum corps chops just because it's such a popular thing. Uh, so a, a, a lot, but what I would say is like, you know, learn those rudiments, okay? And I, I noticed just within maybe the past 10 years, a lot of people at HBCUs or taking some of the drum corps style and, and, and adding it in, which I really, really like, you know, like the Cold Steel Boys and, you know, there's different lines out there that are, are are holding on to the tradition of HBCU, but also adding some of the rudimental uh, drum corps stuff, which I really like. You don't have to lose your whole identity because it's still like drumming on drums, you know. Uh, 
chorus HBCUs a hell of a lot more funkier than, you know, some of the cheese dog and it's going on in the drum corps world. It's like, well, you know, that's fast, fancy stuff, but you know, people want to want to two and four it a little bit. So I think both sides are learning from each other big time, you know, because every time an HBCU drum line or something's coming down the street or happens to be around as drum corps guys, the first thing they want to do is this. And I'm going, yeah, it's a natural reaction because that's what the music is telling you. It's telling you this is about strong two and four. And this is this is jamming, you know, this is Motown, this is Tamla Records, this is Gordy, this is, you know, back back in the day where it all started. So there is a, a close difference. Now to me, the biggest difference between the two is there's there's more showmanship, maybe not more, but a different kind of showmanship that the average person uh can get their hands onto and get into now, which is HBCU because there's a lot of dance. It's the reason why the snare drums are so low, so they can move around and groove with the rest of the band. You know, that's that. Uh, that's what I figured out. It took me a while to figure that. How come the drums are way down there? Well, they can be anywhere you want, but the the drum lines move just like the the wind players. You know, everybody's kicking it. So, you know, there's so much. Now, the drum corps guys are wanting to do that, but they're restrained. They still have to have their, want their drums right here, right there, because there's so much of a, a stick height and a uniform approach thing, which uh, is one thing that I'm seeing that HBCU drum lines are getting more involved with. Because here's the bottom line. The average person is gonna get off on number one when they see in the brothers and the sisters dancing because we know how to dance better than anybody. It's just the way it is. Sorry. <laughs> you, know? you know, and that wasn't a real apology either. I ain't apologizing for it. It's, it's, it's just the way it is. So people can relate to that. And the marching, uh, the, the rudimental stuff, the wow factor is like the clarity. You know what I mean? It's like there's no ticks, there's no mistakes. And the heights are like, perfectly this, you know, this and that. And it's almost, it can almost be sterile if you make a comparison. And a lot of people do. A lot of people say, nah, I don't really like that. I like this because everybody's, hey, you know. But, and then, you know, the rudimental guys are saying, well, I like this because it's really paying attention to detail and this and that. Well, both sides now are borrowing from each other. And that's what I like the most since it's, it's still it's still two distinct different styles, but they're not one is not taking over the other, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Um, HBCU has kind of calmed down now. It used to be all side drums back in the day, you know, but now the quads have gotten in the mix a little bit, which is cool. Uh, the problem with that though is the tuning. If you're gonna tune them the same way as you tune uh, the rudimental percussion, you're gonna get lost with the band because usually the, all the HBCU bands are huge and they're filling up the bores, man. They got air is flowing, you know? And <laughs> it, it, yeah, man, the air is flowing. And if your drums are tuned like the marching percussion rudimental guys, you're not gonna be heard. Or if you're trying to play all the busy stuff, it's too fast to, to, to be heard, to be cut, to cut through all of that, mainly the brass, but woodwinds too. So there's a thin line right there. You know, there's the, the, the writing, I think the way the drums were tuned from, from the beginning with HBCU, they were re relatively low. But I think that they just figured out, somebody figured out way back in the day that they're low because that sound can cut through the size of those bands. You know what I mean? If they're cranked up too high, you gotta be absolutely perfect execution like, you know, Blue Devils and Santa Clara and all those guys, that, that kind of stuff to be able to cut 
And it still does. And there's some great snare lines in HBCU now, man. You know, you're talking Bethune Cookman and, and you know, Cole Steel, and, you know, we can go on Norfolk, FAMU, you know, they're, you know, <laughs> they add, you know, you add, they, they're starting to play, they're starting to play the stuff and adding in, but sometimes you can't hear them. Yeah. You know, cause the stuff is too tight and it's all about, with that size of band, you can't have the stuff that tight. And plus, you know, there's like 20 snares in some of these groups and you still can't hear them. And like that that problem is because for people are trying to write the drum corps style for HBCU. And what's getting in the way is the size of the bands. You see what I mean? The wind players. So, you know, there's a real thin line there, what a uh, thin line there, what you can do. Now the side tenor drum players are learning to execute a little bit more now. It's not all super wild swinging individual approach. There's a technique to it where everybody's playing together. Now it's fun when you're throwing down and playing it as hard as you can. But when you get about six to eight, you know, to 12 guys doing that, there has to be some kind of uniform approach. Otherwise that loudness is gonna clash with each other in the, in the section. So it's about cleaning it up. The same thing with the bass drums. Uh, bass drums these, these these days, some are getting more to the rudimental style that HBCU guys, but at the same time, it's really all about how well they're playing unison together. Are they attacking the same? So when you have doom, skadoom, goom, goom, skadoom, you know, when you're throwing down and got a pocket groove, you got to be tight on that. You're trying to sound like one drum on a drum set, right? Yep. You know. So that's what a lot of people got to remember what's going on. You're mimicking the sound because you like the way it sounds. So when you teach, you got to still teach why you like the way that sound, not apply. There has to be a little bit more uniform technique. And that's what I like about HBCU. You know, a lot of lines are getting into really defining that uniform technique right now. And you know, the, the it's quad players or single tenors this way now. Some, you know, I'm noticing it's, it's grown. You know, everybody's going to the, like with, with the snares, you know, the drum here instead of the side drums. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It's what it is. It's the tuning that's going to match up with the band and the, the uniform technique, which is still missing in a few groups. You know, it's there's a little too much freedom, I feel, with everybody playing the same parts, but different approaches to the drums. And that's where you lose a lot of uh, projection going through the, the, the wind players. Uh, and sometimes it's just too many notes as well. Okay, if, you're good. Gonna mimic, if you're gonna mimic the sound of the drum sets, there's not a lot of notes in the bass drum. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the snare drums two and four are still alive and dandy right now. <laughs> so you know you got to be careful if you're doing that you don't try to dress it up too much and try to get it all fancy drum and bugle core because people a lot of people don't know how to write for that and still uh get a nice nice groove going on there's a there's an art to that as as well so there's a lot Thank of pros, pros and cons i hope that answered some of your questions it's, you know if, if if we need to go into detail about something specific again please just throw it at me no, maybe we'll circle back, but um, you pretty much addressed that, um, the question I asked, so thank you. All right, yes, sir. <laughs> so um, how would you describe your teaching style when it comes to marching percussion? Hmm. I, I'm a, a hardcore stippler about clarity of articulation. So I will cut anything in a minute just to work on one bar because if you can get your point out in one bar it's going to be easier to, to get your point out to four bars eight bars 16 or two the whole approach you got to let the people know that you're real dead serious about trying to get all these people to play together and sounding like one you know so it's really about the uniform approach that I teach more than anything. It's like cut, you know, that sounds pretty decent, but 
I can't take that to the bank. You're doing competition. Uh, it's going to sound like that because we were just lucky that time. You know what I mean? Sometimes you're lucky. It's like, do it again. It's like, uh-huh. And you can see what the issues are. Somebody's hand comes up a little bit quicker. Yeah. So it's really like the microfine glass, you know, with, with uh, you know, the rudimental percussion trying to get everybody to, to play in unison. The, the approach to the drum has to be incredible. And some guys are really good at it. I mean, I, I wasn't as good as like somebody like Paul Rennick, those guys that are all teaching over at Santa Clara now. I mean, I had a few ticks here and there, but I was playing some stuff. I felt uh, obligated to bring some new stuff to the activity. One, which is playing a drum percussion feature at Pianissimo, it's soft. It just blew everybody away. It was like, what? I'm going, well, when somebody sees all a whole big line of drums and a gong and a giant bass drum, the first thing they were gonna wanna do is put their hands up to the ears to protect themselves because it's loud. But I said, well, let's, there's all kinds of colors in our percussion instruments and we can really hear them if we play everything in a pianissimo little and draw your audience in and forced to get a little, a little closer and pay attention a little bit more if you have, not something that's just soft for one or two or three or four counts. If you have a whole percussion piece of the soft and it has three major accents in it, and those happen to be at mezzo forte, but they sound like it's fortissimo because everything else, the majority of the whole piece is at mezzo piano. You see what, yeah. you see what I mean? Uh, a lot of uh, wind players do that too. You know, they'll get a good quality of the sound. Like Jim Prime is uh, one cat that did that, the brother that taught the Garfield Cadets for years and then Star of Indiana. There's nobody better, better, better than him to this day right now. But he used to write these pieces, man, where like the whole three minutes worth of music was like mezzo forte. And then your ears get used to it and it sounds so clear and sounds really loud. Then when he wants to smack it, bam, it's just like, what? How did he do that? How did they play that that loud? But it's just one of the tricks of the trade that it's not that loud. It's just like the majority of the pieces are a lot, a lot softer sometimes. So that contrast is what gets, wakes people up. They'll go, whoa, or something suddenly gets loud. Or wow, you draw them in if something suddenly gets soft and they all stay for long periods of time or certain periods of time before, not just, usually when you hear something that gets soft and drumming, it's only for a couple of bars or something and everybody's right back up there. But if you stay down there for a while and then use the other dynamic levels for expression, you know, you could wow a lot more people. You know, that's something that I've figured out just, you know, in the process and having some, um, good, being able to have some good hands around for quite some time. Okay. Good yeah. stuff. Good point, thank you. All right, yeah. Okay. So, so you have written some good stuff over the years. Um, something I wanted, you know, I wanted to do right for a drum corps is always my dream. Um, I missed my time, you know, wanting to march um, for the. It was I tried to audition for the Crossman, but that was a while back. Um, yeah. yeah. But talk to us about how your percussion writing has evolved over the years. Well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll tell you, uh, it hasn't uh, evolved really that much but it hasn't changed that much what has changed slightly here and there is learning and adoring what other people have written in the activity that have just grabbed me and it's like oh man like i never even thought of that even though like i was winning a lot but there's still great people out there that are doing stuff that i didn't do and i was really attracted to that so I wouldn't say I would steal, everybody borrows. There's not a music phrase in the world that hasn't been played already. So everybody needs to get over themselves like they made something up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that's how, it, that, that's how it's all worked out for me is it, it, it's just learning from other people, other writers, and not necessarily like stealing your stuff, but learning how it works and like Tom Hannum is a perfect example that, that worked for the cadets for years. I think he, yeah, he writes for uh, uh, Crown right now. Yeah. 
and uh, his stuff, man, he's so intricate. And I've learned a, a, a lot of things from him, just his writing. And I went, oh, you know, how come I've never done that before or, uh, you know, or expressed like that? I know about that. How come I never did it? Sometimes it takes somebody else's ideas to bring out something that might be going on in your head. And then after talking with him for years, he's the kind of guy, I remember him telling me, he goes, man, before I write anything, man, I dropped the needle. And what he meant was, you know, back then, it was just records, you know? And so that's when you remember dropping the needle, you know? Yeah. Uh, there wasn't any, any, you know, they wouldn't need any, any um, cassette tapes or any of that stuff yet. He says, man, and I listen to your stuff all the time. I learned so much, I go, really? Uh, I said, I learned a lot from you too. And I said, you know, it's interesting that your stuff doesn't sound like mine and mine doesn't sound like yours. And that's the key. You know, we all learn from somebody and we're not trying to copy, you know? I mean, sometimes we'll do copy somebody's stuff to do a spoof on it, or it's just too cool. And you just had to, had to lay it out there. But, you know, you don't want to go verbatim. You got to still add your own little taste to something to see, you know, put this to this together with your thing and look what I came up with. So, um, yeah, mainly what I learned from um, my surroundings, from uh, other people's ideas. Uh, I haven't really changed that much. I don't know, maybe I have. What do you guys think? You guys have heard some of my stuff from back in the day. I started writing and well, for Santa Clara, I started writing in 1975, you know, and up to you know, the Blue Knights I did for 16 years too. And I, I don't, I'll, I'll okay. give I guess I just try to be musical more than anything. Yeah. You know, when I say that, I'm not talking necessarily classical music. I'm talking about everything that we all listen, listen to, you know? Yeah. So does that help? Oh, yes, sir. Does that answer the question? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I can tell the difference, I guess you would, you know, from the 70s drum corps to the 80s to the 90s, you know, everything evolved. So, you know. I see what you Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm gonna chime in on that. I'm not, I won't belabor this point too much. Um, I'm gonna, EP, I'm gonna use you as an example, right? And you've heard me say this all the time, but like no, no matter what happens, I can always recognize your writing, right? Mm -hmm. what, what changes for me is the, the clarity of the drums, like the, the drums itself you know, how the drums sound. Yeah. That's the only difference, but I can always, I don't care who's writing, I, I can, that's my boy EP. I, I know his writing, I know his, um, his, his things that he puts in, his cliches and he writes, I, I know your writing. Um, I think going back to Mr. Hardiman, what you said, um, the clarity and articulation, right? And I saw that 1984, that, that 1984 show that you were talking about in regards yeah. to very, very pianissimo, that drum feature. And I encourage folks to get an idea to actually watch it. It's, it's on YouTube, you can watch it as many times as you want. But in regards to your writing, the only thing that I notice is, like you said, you're, you're a stickler for clarity and it's always gonna be clarity. The only thing that changes is the, the, the sound of the drums per se, not the, yeah. the writing. So. Okay. I just wanted to point that out there and, and, and give my, my boy EP a shout out, you know, real quick. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. EP in the house. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're right about that, the tuning. Uh, I was always a stickler. The word vanguard, if you look it up or if you know, it, it means leaders of the pack, you know? So I really took that, that name you know, to heart. And so that made me, I was in a position to always experiment. And if you notice the different size drums that I had every year, man, especially in the quads, I had, you know, the ones with the, with the scoops on them, the one regular toms, I had the different cutaways. And, you know, I'll tell you a story about the cutaways too. Uh, it was something that Fred Sanford, who was a, a mentor of mine, we used to, we were in a, bar one night having some beverages and just writing stuff uh, on these napkins because we were up him and I both were always experimenting in new drums 
new sounds. We developed a 14 inch drum because all of them used to be 15. So we even had a 13 inch drum and we decided not to really put that on the market. But the, the cutaway drums we made up, we just said, I remember saying, you know what, Fred, if you cut the front of the drum out, everybody's gonna think it's louder. <laughs> and he went, wow. And you know what? To this day, everybody still thinks it's louder, but it ain't. You know, the cats that the engineers that that, uh, that made all that made drums years ago before all of us were born had it figured out already. The circumference and the diameter is going to give out this certain amount of sound. Then you start getting in the way with. I guess if you listen to a set of concert toms, and usually there's a set of those in the pit up front. If you listen to them in a whole set of quads, five quad players, which is the average size now for a drum corps, one set of concert toms is louder than five quad players. You know, just because you ain't, you haven't messed, you know, you haven't boned it up. You know, concert toms don't sound good when they're all boned up. This is dead, <clears throat> you know. Uh, so I've always experimented with different sounds that you could get out of the drums and still, you know, uh, get a lit different kind of uh, uh, projection. It still was all about project projection. Uh, a lot of the drummers like, eh, let's tighten it up, you know, and like, especially the quad players and these things get so tight, it becomes a personal thing for them because they like playing them. And I'm going, man, but that don't sound good. <laughs> You know, we got the drums are made for some tone and we're going through all of these heads, you know, like you guys don't have to pay for them, you know, like you never did or anything, you know, because uh, the drum companies were always, always giving us guys like whatever we wanted back in the way they still do. Yeah. But, um, you know, so it was always experimenting with me with uh, different tensions uh, on the drum. I had snares reefed all the way up to only dogs could hear them. And I found out that, you know, that was a, a personal thing because that's what the guys, all the guys in line like that, that sound that only dogs can hear, you know, because it's fun to play on. So I kind of got rid of that, said, okay, this is not making any sense. <laughs> Plus, you're not that good. <laughs> you know, we, we can hear all every mistake that you make on it. Uh, different size bass drums I had, just what's going to speak the best. Uh, you know, and then we came up with all these different muffling things, you know, and, and instead of, you know, like the, the HBCU cats, they don't put no muffling on those drums. And I think that's like the, one of the smartest things ever, because we started talking about earlier how you need that sound to cut through the sides of the band. A lot of people don't think about that. And whether that was that was done for that reason or not is really irrelevant. But it's relevant now because that's the only way you can hear the drum line mostly, man. It's cutting through all in brass, playing full bore. It's like, don't even think about putting no patch on them bass drums, man. <laughs> what you need is to make sure that everybody's approaching it the same so it doesn't go good oak. You know, you got six to eight bass drummers, man. You want uh, and the right technique so that sound gets through. So a lot of a lot of different tuning things I did over the years, different size sticks, tenor sticks, this stick, this stick, you know, just ex just experimenting because I felt like I was obligated to do that for the activity, you know, because of the Vanguard name, you know, kind of said so I had to get a grip on something because there wasn't no other brothers around, you know, at that level, uh, up in the top three uh, for years that were teaching drum course. And I, I never paid a lot of attention to it until my family started talking about it a little. So, you know what, man, we're noticing that uh, ain't a whole lot of brothers off in here. I'm going, yeah? Well, I learned uh, to not pay too much attention to that because I just wanted some hands. And then after a while, you know, I had to go out and find some brothers too because I wanted some brothers in the line. You know, I just, I just wanted it. It's like, hey man, it's like, 
I got to have me some bros off in here. So I don't know. I played around with different implements. And, you know, I'm curious about some of the sticks that uh, a lot of people use. Okay. Why? You know, I ask a lot of people questions uh, about that because I want to know if they could tell me something that I don't, uh, I don't know. I'm really curious. Oh, my drum instructor told me to use these or we've always used these or we think this is best because of this or whatever. You know, but I ask a lot of questions. Uh, I pay attention to what everybody's doing all the time, trying to learn something to this, right. to this day. No. Yes, sir. Good points. Thank you. Yes, sir. I now, love I, all. Of, I love all of it. <laughs> and Rick, before you move on, I just want to, you know, echo what Mr. Hardiman said about far as when you're writing, you get an inspiration. You listen to other, you know, sometimes composers, but just other music. You know, poker, uh, rock, um, music in Russia. I don't know what if that's a genre. I don't know, but <laughs> listen to different stuff. You know, <laughs> so when yeah. I tell my students that, you know, same thing, this is the different stuff. But I just want to pick it back off that. That's it. <laughs> yeah, well, I love that. I'm glad that you're doing that because I'm a stickler with all of my students. In fact, in the drum corps, me and Fred Sanford started these things, uh, this listening, uh, these listening things that we used to do for the drum lines, a reason to have drum line parties, you know, to get everybody together, you know, crack a few couple of beers and stuff like that, but mainly we brought every bit of music that you could think of yeah. to these parties and say, listen, the reason why I want you guys to listen to this is not to try to get you to like it, but just to understand that it's out there and somebody likes it. Yeah. And you know, you might even like it if you gave her yourself a chance. Yeah. And one of the cats said, Yo, well, how about country and western, Ralph? You listen to that? I said, way more than any of you suckers think. <laughs> <laughs> I got yeah. a few guys. I know who Conway Twitty Nim is. Yeah. You know, but you know, if, you know, my point was is there's something to say about that. And did you know that country and western music was the most popular music in the world? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, see, there's a there's something to say. Now, you can't say that all the people that like this stuff are chumps or they don't know what they're talking about or listening to, man. How dare you? And who are you to say that? Yeah. So that was yeah. my point. And, you know, and, it, and to this day, my main thing is encouraging everybody to listen to a lot, as much different music as you can, as much as you can. And even like on Facebook, I'll throw, you know, so, always some kind of music thing or something different you know, stuff from, from Latin America. It, most of us all percussion, African drumming, you know, all, all of this stuff, man, you know, where people are playing instruments that people never seen before. Because shoot, man, I mean, a lot of this stuff has been out way before us, man. We gotta, we gotta do something with all of this stuff, you know, like something good. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, that's really important to me. Yeah, and you know, Mr. Hardiman, you you really talked up some good points, and we're pretty much, you know, we're really moving through this. And I'm glad you're taking the time out with us today. You know, um, with everything that's been going on. Um, one thing I've read a couple of articles, and before I go into my next question, obviously, you know, we want to do our research before we have you on and everything. And there was one quote that I remember vividly that you said, and it says, "My reward," and, and quote, "This is you talking." Quote, "My reward as a teacher." has been the success of the students in the programs, end quote. And that's something that, that you said. And yeah. it really much transitioned into my next question as a music educator in the world of percussion. You know, what have you noticed throughout with the students throughout the years of teaching, i.e., you know, when you first started teaching, you know, um, the attitudes, the talent, the playing level, things like that. What have you just noticed throughout your well, years? First, we'll start off with the, the, the talent levels. I think that uh, talent levels are coming up, uh, uh, again, with the drum corps thing, because people are realizing that it's not easy to get in, and a lot of uh, youngsters are, are in awe with it, and they realize that they got to practice, you, that you got to practice, you got to practice right. And that's why, you know, come to... Uh, to rehearsals, you know, they, they ask questions later on. They go, man, you know, 
you guys don't work on the music too much. I'm going, well, not yet at this time of the year. We're, we're working on fundamentals and working on a, a uniform approach to the instruments. And we're trying to get everybody not only to look the same, but to have the same touch on the instrument. I mean, some people play harder than others and some people play soft. And that's not gonna get you the best sound. I tell you, a lot of people overplay the drums sometimes. And what happens is sometimes that can cancel out the sound. You know, it's like, boom. It's like, it just, it's just like, it's so loud that it, that it mutes itself sometimes. So uh, the, the uniform approach to the instrument, in my drum lines, if one person is playing louder than the other, it shows up and sometimes it sounds like a tick or a mistake. Uh, and, and it's not, it's just this person is just playing louder than the other. So the difference in the sound of the drum is showing up and sometimes it'll sound like a mistake. That's why it's a, so important that, you know, we tune the drums up for rehearsal all the time. We, we like the guys who get used to the drums sounding the same always. And we really did fine tune before a contest. You see, everybody's doing all of this, you know, to get it, you know, just right. But most of the time, the drums are pretty close, um, which I think is, is extremely important. And you want to get the kids to play with the same velocity. Some people like to play harder because it's fun. But in terms of uh, the rules that you set up, it's like, no, everybody's got to play with the same touch not softer, not lighter. That's why we have people go down the line and play and we see individuals, their approach. And you go, ah, oh, you just changed, man, because before you were playing harder than that, now we're putting you on the spot and then you're playing the way you're supposed to. And it'd be like, you know, why are you trying to hide? You're not hiding from nobody, especially me. Yeah. You know? In That's fact, true. it's time for you to sit down for a little bit and watch <laughs> and watch the pros. I mean, I've been messing with people. I, mean, you know, I set the guys up that are getting ready to play. I think you need to sit down and, and watch the pros play a little bit. So of course the guys are gonna extra puff up and they're gonna play exactly what you want them to play for the guy, the guy that was shucking and jiving. So, you know, it's little rehearsal techniques that, you know, you learn to throw in here too. Sometimes, sometimes it's, you know, it's, it, you gotta spank the kids a little bit or, you know, somebody will be out of line a little bit in their touch. Again, you know, playing softer or louder. Hey, tell and them to sit down and sit off to the side and watch the pros real quick, right? <laughs> yes, right. Or you take a dollar out of your wallet, go to the end of the drum line and say, pass this down the line. People don't know what you're talking about. I'm going, all you suck is just passing the buck right now because I just asked who was it doing that? And you guys, you know, I admire that you're all covering from each other for each other, because you know who's playing louder, who's playing softer, just as much as I do standing out here. So sometimes I have to have fun and pass the buck because they kind of trying to look after their team. But there's no hiding. I mean, you can tell when somebody's playing louder or softer, and they can have the same heights and and look the same. But some people are just just hitting it a little too a, a little too harder. And that that's one thing I've seen, especially in the, the side tenor drums, man, and, and, and uh, our brother's drum lines. Some guys like, boy, they play it as hard as they can, you know? And it's like, do you know that that sound is not really getting out up front the, the way you think it might be? If your whole tenor line was playing like that, it might be, but if you drop it down one dynamic level and get everybody to play at that same dynamic level, then the drums are going to project. It's just the way the, how sound works, you know, how it co comes at you. So that's extremely important uh, that make sure that none of the kids are playing over playing or under playing. Everybody's playing with the same touch. Then the sound is going to project and it's going to get a lot finer. That's a lot of the differences in some of the better sounding drum lines and drum corps. It's not necessarily that they're better players. Uh, it's just that they're approaching the drums equally the same and therefore that's creating a better sound. The technique is the same and it's, that's a technique as well. You know, everybody playing with the same touch. It's, you know, it's like a drumline technique. 
So that's really important. I, I got off again on what, what exactly the question was. I think it was a, a, a few questions mixed in together, but did uh, I No, just to bring you back here, just uh, was just asking, you know, just, you know, if you think about just the talent level, but you pretty much, you pretty much hit on it. Um, just the talent level of the, the, the kids, the attitude when you first started with the kids as opposed to now, you know, have you noticed a change over throughout the years? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have. I'm trying to think of uh, something else that's might have changed. Well, the tuning is, uh, is, has definitely changed a lot. Like you guys said, the sound is, uh, is mentioned. People aren't copying so much. Well, so-and-so's drums are up here, so we're going to crank ours up too. Man, oh, no, you're exposing yourself even more. You don't want to, you don't want to do that unless you can play on those. Right. You know, I think everybody's figuring it out in the activity right now that uh, they're learning to tune the drums more for the, 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 the level of kids that they have. You know, it's like you got to be careful. You don't want to crank them up there and then you expose them. And it just doesn't even sound good. It's like, you know, you're, you're copying somebody else's ideas, but you got to understand why they're doing that as well. You know, and I, that's what I had to do growing up too. I was afraid to copy somebody because unless you're doing it right or you put your own spin on it to make it something, it's, it's got to be something extra special, but it's got to be done right too. You know, you just can't copy somebody and don't know why they're doing it. You can get in a lot of trouble and I'd see a lot of lines doing that and go, well, why are you doing this? Well, that's the way, you know, we saw, you know, the Peterborough crescendos do it. So I'm going, to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to get a grip. It ain't, it's not like that so much, you know? You, so yeah, there's some things that I've learned over the years and, and things that have, have uh, uh, gotten better. Uh, I, I feel like that I'm learning more now that I'm, I finally like, got out of having my own drum lines and stuff because I've done so many years of it. Yeah. And now I'm just kind of working and teaching teachers and going out around and doing clinics and, and hanging out with the different cores a little bit just to talk to the guys because I know I know just about everybody in the activity and most of them uh, know me too because you're that guy. That's well, yeah, right. one of the guys, you know, like, you're that guy. <laughs> Like a lot of cats, it's, they're finally kind of used to it, but it was hard for a lot of people to believe that I was the guy yeah. that was teaching Santa Clara all those years. Yeah. In fact, you know, when my sticks came out, there's some people that didn't even know that I was a brother. They just never knew that, that what? You teach well, who? Mr. Oh, Hardiman. Man, I've been teaching it for years, man. I'm, Mr. Hardiman, let me, I'm glad you mentioned that. Listen, listen, this gets into my next, listen. I have, I have these, I have bought other sticks, right? I have uh, bought other marching sticks, but I have never, ever, in my whole, they listen to marching and drum line, I have never, ever used any other sticks but Ralph Hardiman's. I, I will say this, and this goes all the way back to when I first started. I have never, ever not used these sticks. Now, I have bought others. But these sticks, the Ralphie Juniors, Perfect. and, 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 you, and you, it, it, this, this is my next question, right? What was just the inspiration behind your drum, these line of drumsticks? Because they have lasted through the test of time. Well, I t I'll tell you uh, how it all started out. Vic Firth called me up, okay? And I didn't know it was Vic Firth. I thought it was some of my homeboys because we always act, be acting up you know, on the phone. So, <laughs> this guy's, I mean, hello? Hello, is this Ralph Hardiman? I'm going, yes. And this, he goes, well, this is Vic Firth. And uh, I was like, man, this ain't no Vic Firth, man. <laughs> you know what you're talking about? And he's going, yes, this is Vic Firth. And I said, uh, no, it ain't. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, he goes, you know, your name sounds like Ralph Hard On, man. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh Lord, have mercy! This is Big Bird. I heard about, I heard about this sucker. You know, say, you know, I know, I heard because he was a strange. You know, he passed away not too long ago. But man, yeah, he was your typical drummer. That guy, man. 
I'm telling you, and he called me up and, you know, and he said, well, I'm calling you because, you know, I'd like to do a signature drumstick. And I'm like, wow, what? A signature stick? And I was like, wow, okay. So I started working on some ideas. And the first idea I got it from was, uh, I liked a, uh, who's, who's stick, what was that company? Regal Tip, remember Regal Tip? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, they had a stick. I, I remember going to their factory once just to go on a tour. And they had a stick that we used in Santa Clara all the way up to maybe my last four years. My, my drum stick didn't come out until after, I think 90, after I, my last year in Santa Clara. So they never played on my stick over there, but the Blue Knights did. But anyways, uh, it was all about a, that Regal, stick it was in, it was these sticks it was in this big band bin i mean i'm like what are these ah well those are just something we had around here and we're probably going to use them for something or you know or it was almost like for firewood so i picked out a pair and i was like hey man you know i like these we're going to use these over in santa clara so i just liked the way they felt and so when i first started um you know working on my my design that was the first thing I talked to Neil about is I said, I like the way these feel. I don't necessarily care the way they look. And so some of his engineers, you know, by me saying that and the information that I gave him was what's simple, what I just gave you guys, they said, well, try these. What do you think of this? And I went, oh, wow, you know, this is how it works. So I'm going, well, this is close, but if we could get a little bit more like around in the shaft closer to the bead, a little bit more thickness, and they were going, well, well, why is that? I said, because that's where everybody plays rim shots. And, you know, you want the stick to be strong right there. They said, oh, okay. So about after three different ideas and uh, try this beat out, try this beat out. It wasn't me knowing what I wanted. It was what I thought I might have like. And they would print, send examples. And then I go, yeah, okay. And then I get more of an idea. If we could put a little bit more weight here and, and less here in the back. And that's how those all came about. Uh, then the Ralphie Juniors were next. And I said, I wanted the same exact, everything exactly the same, except for a smaller stick for the junior high and the elementary. This is what this is gonna, you know, be for the, uh, the smaller hand. But I want the weight distribution to be the same. Actually, and I will say that that Ralphie Junior, um, uh, it's a it's a good drum set stick. I, I will say it. Oh, you um, playing drum set? I I, I I I use them for a drum set, and it's it's a, a good drum set stick amongst oh, other things. Yeah. But I will say that that Ralphie Junior stick for those who don't have it is it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, like you know, I that wasn't my original uh, idea for that, but I could see how just the weight distribution. If it's if it was the same as my other one, the other one was just the way it just felt in the hands. And so I wanted to, uh, a, a smaller one with the same, you know, weight distribution, but yep. smaller and it happens to be just, it just feels good in there. And so I did the same thing with the medium stick. And that's the stick that I personally like the most because, you know, I, I'm not used to playing with three S's that much anymore. You know, I, in fact, I don't play that much in, uh, at, at all that much. I, just because it hurts, you know, I got arthritis, of old, old boy stuff, you know, starting to come into play, you know, uh, but, you know, I could still play, but not, not throw down cheese dogging like I used to do in the day, man, when I marched in, in the Kings when it first started teaching Santa Clara, but um, yeah, the sticks, you know, and then, you know, everybody started liking the product and then I did a tenor drum stick and then I altered that and then we had another stick that, the hammers for practicing. And then we put the rubber bead on top of those, you know, in case you wanted to try to get away with playing on mom's table. Not in my house though. There was right. no drumming on the table. <laughs> not at all. It wasn't happening. Katow, boy, let me tell you. <laughs> not, not, not at all. No. But, uh, you, you, um, I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Hardiman, because um, the inspiration that you have given to a lot of people who, who didn't know who you were, until now or don't know who you are, but this is the man behind the Rob Hardiness. Here he is. Yeah, Thank man. you. 
Well, I appreciate that, you know, you guys have, have me around and everything. And, and got mine. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Hey. Yeah. Uh, but the HV. Go ahead, EP. Yes. You know, I'm just, I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. This is something that, that, that I grew up with. You know, my family, it was Grambling when I was a kid. Grambling. I didn't even know about anybody else, if there was any other black colleges or whatever, how that all worked when I was yeah. a kid, because of the folks and everybody it was all, Grambling was on TV before anybody back in the day, you know, that was, uh, I don't think they're as, as cool as they were in the past, right? just because everybody else has come up all over the place, you know, that, that are equal and some, uh, some that were better, but, as I started paying attention to more of the lines, you know, Norfolk, Tennessee State, you know, Bethune Cookman, uh, you know, everybody is like, man, you know, these people are starting to say something now. Cause you know, I was figuring out in the process, you know, and it's some things I'd mentioned earlier, like they didn't put anything, uh, any to dampen the sound of the drums uh, on the bass drums and, and the tenor drums, you know, they were all just wide open. And at first I was like, you know, I don't know if I like that or not because we did it this way. And then I realized that, as I said earlier, well, maybe that's done just so it could cut through the band because and then I said, whether they know it or not, that's what it's doing. You know, you can hear the drum lines a lot better. Uh, it's when everybody's playing together, of course, and the, the technique is that uniform approach a little bit more tighter, but it's cutting through all those brass playing at Fortissimo. Sometimes I think they overplay, but that's just style, you know? I mean, the brothers know how to fill up the boars and them horns, man, and yeah. then some. <laughs> they do not mess around with it. Now, I know a lot of drum corps cats that would die to have those guys with that much air uh, and refine their, their plan. And, uh, you know, some of the cats are starting to come over in core, and they have to tune the suckers down all the time because these the brothers used to come over and do core and just out blow anybody. Yeah. So what they do is is they're trying to get, I you know they'll use somebody from HBCU for an example, and say this is the amount of sound that I want you guys to be able to put through your horn. Everybody will laugh. You see, but we'll refine it, you know, because these cats got lungs man and all the stuff that all the drum corps are working on to develop this like natural it's natural for you know for yeah. the big bands to do that it's it's just amazing so there's a lot of stuff that i discovered by by watching everybody over the years uh that there's some stuff that that's done over there that i thought that or still don't know that was it figured out because of the size of the bands or was this just uh, you know a traditional thing or you know that some stuff I, I have no idea I haven't asked enough people about it because I didn't really care I just said I just I know for a fact that the way the drums are tuned right now some of them could probably use a little bit of muffin but very little I would much rather if I had to make a choice I would use none than yeah. just, just the way they are so <laughs> so, so. So, so, Mr. Hardman, quick question. Who is your favorite HBCU drum line? Well, it, it changes. It, you know, it's switched around over the years. I think more consistently lately would be maybe North Carolina. Maybe. Okay. But I also like, I like Norfolk a lot. They know how to play. They play together. They work on a uniform approach to the drum. Uh, so does so does North Carolina, Bethune Cookman, same thing. You know, Pedro them over there. Yeah. You know they they uh, you know Prairie View. You know, uh, there's a few others. You know, but it it switches for me because some people sound right better in 1919 than they do in 1921. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm I'm curious. Uh, to ask you guys, who's your favorite HBCU line and why? Now, I know you're probably going to see yourself, your own line, but I know the why, because I know, man, brothers are real partial to it. 
to, to their uh, to their schools, man, and their fraternities and all that. I know all about all of that. But you know, well, since we're asking the questions, <laughs> well, well, I'll go first. You know, of course, Virginia State. You know, that's where I, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. Okay. Um, after that, I would say it's a tie between Bethune Cookman and T N North. Bethune Cookman because you know what? Well, first of all, all the, all three schools they playing some beats. You know, Bethune Cookman they use the the the, the the carabelle and tambourine. I that's like where, that a lot. That's where the live percussion come in for me. That's right. Um, a and T, they're gonna give you a mixture of the HBCU and the core style with the stick tricks and stuff. Norfolk, oh, yeah. Norfolk gonna give you the straight beats. Um, so it's them three, you know, are my number two, but Virginia State, my school number one. <laughs> I got you, man. No exp explanation. <laughs> so. No it works. <laughs> so here, here it is for me. Um, obviously, I'm going to go with the home team, Virginia State, VSU. You know, I, I, with hands down, I would go to that. But here's the thing. Who would I pay to go see in a battle? Prairie View. Period. Uh, That's who I would, I would, I would go and see them in a battle. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, that's all. I mean, I like, I like. HBC drumline since just in general, but when we get talking about um, who, who do we like the best? Well, no, I'm gonna go and pay to see this line right here. Um, that's who I would like. I like I Virginia like State and Prairie View. I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, I like the clarity out of Norfolk uh, State's uh, drumline probably a little bit more than anybody uh, I, I've heard. I, you know, I, I hear less errors, I guess. Yeah. In fact, uh, I think I'm probably talking about the snare line more than anything, the snares and then the, and then, uh, the tenors, just because they look as good as they sound. Now, there's some years where things just reverse, you know, and I mean, there's always, that's what I like about it. It's like, some people are getting it together and some people are doing this. Some people are adding a core style. Some people are doing the stick thing because the stick thing is big time now, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's like serious. But the thing is, it's still got to be clean now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like when we listen to music, the reason why we like it so much and even all of our soul music and funk and this and that, the reason why we like it is because it's clean. You know, it's clean, it's clear. I mean, anybody that goes into the studio to do anything, it's about playing together and execution. And that's what we've been trained to like, whether it's a symphonic orchestra, a wind ensemble, a jazz combo, rock, big band, funk. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's all about, that's why we like it. And that's what a lot of people got to remember uh, why they like it. Yeah. You know, like a lot of the drum instructors, like we got to clean it up a little bit because the people will like it anymore. We're not talking about trade and anything. Maybe some stuff you would get rid of because so it's hard to clean, but there's so much GE, general effect, and, and what the, uh, our boys are doing out there, man, with all the dancing on top of it and the moves, and some of it is jamming. Now, it limits you a little bit. I like how everybody, most of the snare lines will go to a good solid two and four so they can move and dance and this and that. And some people even figured out, I've seen a couple couple of lines, man, in the last three years with them quads out there. I'm going, man, I could never do that with a set of them on, boy. And, you know, they gotta be careful in the, in the later years. Cause, you know, I just, from from drumming and wearing that strap for so many years, man, back, back in the day, I finally had to break down and get surgery about four years ago, man. Degenerated disc four, man. I got titanium all in my neck. Man. Oh man! From that okay. strap, man, and you know, I'm skinny now, so you can imagine how little prune I was when I was a kid. You know, I was throwing down, but I was skinny. Yeah, and that drum yeah. was heavy. Hey, Mr. Hardman, <laughs> hold, hold that thought real quick. EP, you gotta do that thing. <clears throat> yeah, well, I got one more question, um, okay. and I gotta do a lesson, Mr. Hardman. So that's why I'm gonna get through one more question with you. Um, okay. What What would you change about 
you know, the state of HBCU drum lines at this time? Well, or if, of, if anything, if you would change anything. Well, kind of what I see what's happening right now of what, what, you know, I've been talking about. What I'm seeing, there's been some drastic changes in the last four or five years of people picking up what they've learned from the drum corps, which is being a little bit more tighter. And that's why I just mentioned the reason why we like the stuff that we copy is because it's tight when we listen to it or get it or borrow it. Everything that we listen to on an album or a CD or anything is tight. You know, I don't care how funky or how straight and how rock and roll and one and three it might be, it's tight. And that's why people like it more than anything. So that's the thing that I that I would like to see more of the tightness. tightness. And what it is is other things that I talked about, the, the, the technique, the approach. Some people playing harder than others. Right. If you're gonna play harder, your wind up is gonna be probably a little bit bigger. If you're gonna play lighter, your wind up ain't gonna be that big. So by the time the stick comes to the head, this one is gonna come in probably a little bit earlier and that one might be a little bit later and there goes your sound just from one stroke, okay? That's why I see the bass drums and the tenor drummers are starting to tighten it up a little bit more, okay? Not asking anybody to change anything. In fact, you'd be making all the changes yourself if the tightness and clarity of articulation becomes one of your number one things you'll find out what you don't want to use and what you can. Good point. You know, you'll, find, you, you'll, you'll really, really find out. And mostly everything you can use, but you got to work on the clarity. If everybody if you go, nope, that ain't the way it sounded on, on, that, on that bass drum when we were listening to the original. And people, well, how's it going to sound? We have 15 basses, man. How are we going to get to sound like that? Yeah. Easy. Yeah. You got to work on it. <laughs> it's not easy, but... The concept in your mind, what you have to do is easy. Applying it is another thing. Of course. It's easy. You got to work on the <clears throat> approach. It's hard to do, though. You see what I mean? So, so that, to me, is truly uh, the, the most important. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you. So as uh, we said, my, my buddy EP had to go teach a lesson. So I'm going to yeah. go ahead and close it on out here. And this is the, <clears throat> the last question that we have. As a person of color in the percussion world, you know, what challenges have you had to face just in the uh, DCI world and just in percussion, just in general? Well, you know what was funny? Okay, and that, this is interesting. Uh, remember when I told you earlier that because I wasn't cool and I wasn't like everybody else, I was kind of like a, a nerd, if you will. Yeah. You know, that I got picked on a lot when I was a child from my own peeps. You know, and I didn't like, I didn't like that. That bothered me. Um, uh, so when I went to start teaching drum corps and most of it was white cats and stuff, I didn't even think twice about it because I'm like, I know there's a lot of white cats that are around that do this and scared of brothers. And I've taken advantage of, of, of that, you know, uh, in the past a couple of times just to get my point across, not to, not to, you know, really freak anybody out. Right. Like you get off in somebody's mug sometime, and if they, people aren't used to it, it's like, Whoa. but I never really had much of an issue after I got out of the hood. When I started, I moved out to uh, to Anaheim, where Disneyland is, and I was one of the first uh, young blacks to get hired over there to work at Disneyland. And uh, so I was around quite a lot of different ethnicities, if you will. Right. And there was never an issue probably because I never thought about it a lot. I was too busy working, man. You know, like none of that stuff came came easy. I knew what people were, some people were thinking. Like, yeah, you know, but a lot of people envied me from all corners, if you know what I'm saying. Right. And it's like, man, what's... <laughs> so later on when I started thinking about it, I got forced to think about it because some of my scores were a little too weird. I went, man, are these cats like messing with these kids in the line just to get next to me or what? If that's the case and I find out even a little bit of it, I'm coming down. And I 
actually did come down. I mean, it was real private. I came down with some people and just really confronted them just from being really ticked off. Right. You know, in my thoughts, it's just like, wait a minute. And so I called some people out and I made sure everybody knew about it and the whole activity. Here's what I think is going on. And this is real hard for me because that would be an easy thing for me to say and being one of the, the two or three brothers that are in any activity that are doing anything. But I got to say it because, man, nothing else makes any sense. Right. What do you mean? I'm going, well, here's, a, here's the tapes. Here's my drum line. Here's the tapes of the other drum lines. And I, for some reason, there's certain drum lines they won't let me be. And I can't think of any reason why. What's the deal? And they sound weird on the tape, the way they're talking. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're talking down to me, at me. You know, you, you know, I, people will try to do things and be slick on the oh, slide, yeah. man. But I didn't really have a lot of issues because I just, I, I didn't pay attention to it. When some issues came, came up, I did speak my word. And other than that, you know, I never hung out, hang out with a lot of people, man. I always taught and, and people come up and go, you know, man, some people think that you stuck up. I'm going, I'm not stuck up. I just, you know, some people just scared to come up and say hi. I don't have to say hi to everybody. Yeah. But if people want to speak to me, you know, I'll speak to them. But I, that's just all you guys' perception, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it ain't me, I'm, you know. I, you know, I, I've had plenty of everything these days, you know, because there's a lot of envy out there and stuff like that. And I, I got to be careful because everybody's just waiting for me to, to act up. And sometimes I will, but most of the time I want. I'll just get you later. <laughs> you know, but well, we don't have a lot of time for that. You know what I'm talking about. I understand. Yes. Yeah. You know, we can't, we can't dwell on that. But after all, you know, we, we, we are black folk and, you know, a lot of stuff come with the territory. Yeah. To this so, day. Yeah, really good, really good points, uh, Mr. Hardiman. And um, <clears throat> I just want to say once again, thank you for coming on HBC. Man, what a great Drum episode, Lines. Mr. Ralph Hardiman. He gave such good information. I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. We look forward to having him on, maybe perhaps again in the future to talk about some different things. Man, EP, go ahead and take us on out. Yes, yeah, so once again, I want to thank Mr. Ralph Hardiman. But we also want you guys to keep continue to follow, like, and share in our videos, Facebook, Instagram, All Heart Radio, SoundCloud, Pandora, Spotify. Um, hope to see you guys next season. Until next time, everybody take care. You guys have a great evening.